Oh, 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 Do you have a USB-C cable? An iPad cable? Okay. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. Let me see if the uh, audio. Can you guys hear me okay? No, yes, no. Mike's been giving us issues. I think yeah, that one's better. Okay. Let's off the back of it. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi jma'in. Welcome home, everybody. Happy to have you guys back. Alhamdulillah. After we finished our previous, uh, our previous reading, on uh, Imam Ghazali's, from his Ihya, on his uh, rights of, or the virtues of good friendship. We hope, inshallah, that, you know, these sessions are beneficial and that they help cultivate uh, an understanding and a reflection of religion, inshallah, for everybody to, you know, improve themselves. And um, there's no better way for a person to improve themselves than by uh, turning to the Quran. Sorry, my daughter is... What's going on, baby? What's that? Is that for me? No. Oh, okay. It's yours? Okay. You want to stay here with me? Okay. Come. Left leg. Not my right one. <laughs> this side. Come around this side. Here. Okay, you're ready. Oh. Oh. Okay. Oh. The microphone. You gonna sit here the whole time? <laughs> you sure? What do you want to say to everybody? No. Okay. <laughs> a woman of few words. The iPad that's on the floor right here. We can just plug it in. Just a whole hair moment. Appreciate it. What would I do that man? Moment. Um, may Allah Taala make moment from the mini inshallah. Uh, so, like I said, uh, you know, these sessions are meant to be uh, um, a place of working on one's heart. And getting better that's why it's called hard work and you know we read different texts and we try to make it we try to differentiate every few weeks with a different topic and a different theme but we always like to come back to uh you know the core sources the quran the hadith um, and even if i teach something else obviously we're always referencing quran and hadith always but one of the things that i want to accomplish uh in these gatherings is is not just people coming and listening but people coming and gaining confidence to be able to go and read on their own. That's one of my goals. My goal for hard work is that people come here. It's, it's modeled to them kind of like how we read, how we extract reflections and, and, and meaning, and then going and, you know, buying some books, getting your own good copy of translation of the Quran, getting your biography of the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace blessed be upon him, and being able to engage with that on your own so that why you can extract some reflections and some some depth on your own, inshallah, even if you're not at artwork, right? Because because faith should be something that's grown even beyond the Monday night uh, sphere, inshallah. So we're going to be going over, starting tonight, one of my favorite uh, chapters. Really, they're all so incredible in their own right. But this is a chapter that is particularly unique um, in, in a few ways. And it's the chapter that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty, he gifted to the Prophet Sallallahu So this was, you know, one of the revelations that was something that was sent down in response to uh, specific moments that the Prophet Isaac was going through. You know, some revelation had a certain condition that was being revealed to. There was questions being asked or there were issues that were happening in the community. And so Allah would send revelation to respond. And some revelation didn't necessarily have like a catalyst, didn't have like a moment. It was just revelation that was sent by Allah in that moment in time. This surah is a surah in which uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent it. And it wasn't a surah that was necessarily sent to answer like legal questions or to give like, you know, strategy as far as building community or civilization. This surah unanimously across all scholars was gifted by Allah to the Prophet وسلم, as a means of giving him tranquility 
and restoring his heart and giving him strength and a time that he needed it more than, than, than any other time. There was a year during the life of the Prophet Sallallahu and if you were here last night, we referenced this because the, the, the night journey, the ascension, Isra Maraj, it also occurred uh, uh, you know, at the end of this year or after this year. And this year was known as Am al the year of grief, the year of sadness. So again, a lot of times when we think about the life of the Prophet Sallallahu we think of it in very uh, linear terms. Okay, so Mecca was tough, Medina was good, and it was just like an uphill climb, and the Muslims were successful, and, you know, end of story. But we don't realize that the Prophet was 63 when he passed away. So he had 63 years. 23 of those were years of prophethood. And in those years, just like we have 365 days, the Prophet had his days. And just like some days of ours are good, the Prophet ﷺ had very good days. And just like some days are rough, the Prophet ﷺ had some pretty tough times. And so when you look at his life, and this is why I always tell people, when you read the Qur'an, you have to make sure you're reading the biography of the life of the Prophet with it. Peace and blessing be upon him. Because that biography is going to give you the foundation, like the context. Like, what am I reading? This surah is so beautiful, but it's even more incredible to know that it was revealed at a time when the Prophet ﷺ was emotionally at the, the lowest of his low. He was going through one of the most difficult times in his life. Literally, the historians call that year the year of sadness. Okay? And so it's interesting to know. Now, why was it called the year of sadness? It was called the year of sadness because there were three events that historians say occurred that were the three greatest trials on the life of the Prophet ﷺ. The first was that this was the year in which his beloved wife Khadija, anha, God be pleased with her, she passed away. So this was, I mean, it feels even, it feels, it feels wrong to just kind of make that number one on the list. That could be its own session. I mean, the story of the life and the marriage and the relationship of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ with his wife Khadija is something that is I mean, legendary. If you think about it, who was the person that when he first received revelation, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, was the person that gave him that reinforcement and that strength? At that time when it was make or break, he receives revelation from Angel Jibreel and is unsure what to make of it. He doesn't know, hey Muslim, he doesn't know whether or not it's good, whether or not, he doesn't, he's not sure what's going on. And he goes to his wife, and he has friends. There are tribal leaders. There's mentors. He has a he has a, a menu of people to choose from. But he goes first and foremost to his wife Khadija. May Allah be pleased with her. And he's shaking, and he seeks counsel from her. And she says to him, "What happened?" And he tells her the whole story that I was in the cave of Hira, and I was retreating to Hanuf. What he does, Ali Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was reflecting and meditating and in that reflection as he normally did he was sitting there and Jibreel came to me he said and this angel came this creature he didn't know what it was came to me shook me squeezed me told me to recite I didn't know what to recite eventually squeezed me three times like embraced me and he said that each time he embraced me I thought it was it I thought I was going to die like that was my life is over now and he said, until he recited to me this recitation, And at that point, he tells his wife Khadija that, I'm afraid. I don't know what to make of this. And in that moment, make her brain, right? She could have been like, yeah, me either. Right? And what, what would that have done? Right? The spiral continues like, oh my gosh. And, and, and by the way, she doesn't know what's going on either. Khadija's not like tapped into Wahi before the Prophet. No, of course not. But what does she do? I mean, she's his rock. She's the person that grounded the Prophet Sallallahu in his life according to his own description of her. That she believed in me when no one believed in me. She supported me when no one supported me. I mean, that's a sign of loyalty, isn't it? And so what does she do? She doesn't know the answer, 
but she knows for sure the right thing to say, and that is not a punishment. And she tells the Prophet them that Wallah, Wallahi la abadan. Allah would never humiliate you. He would never disgrace you. And then she starts to list off these reasons why. And I don't want to go into that, but I want you just to understand and grasp their relationship. That they were equal support for one another. The Prophet ﷺ was there for her and she was there for him. And it's without exaggeration, it is a true statement, 100% factual, that had it not been for our mother Khadija, may Allah be pleased with her, that the Prophet ﷺ's message, it is no doubt that Allah sent Khadija as a support and a resource and a protector. She was a protector of this message that we are talking about today. There's no doubt. The historians all agree of the seerah of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. They all agree that had it not been for her support, emotionally, mentally, and even financially, that the message of Islam would have not have prospered had in the same way that it did. So this year, Am al huzn the year of sadness was the year that this pillar, this beloved, the coolness of his eyes, she passes away. I can't even process it. Someone loses somebody, beloved to them. How do you move on? What's the next day like? You wake up wondering if it was all a bad dream, only to confirm that it wasn't and that you have to, in fact, keep moving forward. One of the saddest moments of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu the companions used to ask the Prophet ﷺ that, tell us about our mother. Tell us about her. You know, she passed away early in the, in the da'wah, right? We want to know more about her, Ya Rasulullah. Tell us about what was she like. And the Prophet ﷺ literally was lost for words. He would describe, he would start to describe her and then he would just be like, why, why try? I can't. She was who she was. She passes away, radiallahu anha. Just a few short weeks, some scholars say later, they say that all this happened within six weeks. His uncle, Abu Talib. Who's Abu Talib? Abu Talib is the closest family member of the Prophet Sallallahu that's outside of his own like immediate family. The Prophet Sallallahu his father passed away before he was born. His mother passed away when he was young. And... So he was immediately left in the care as a child to his grandfather. Are you taking pictures of everybody? No. Oh, okay. He was immediately left in the care of his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib, because of his age and seniority, is somebody that Quraysh respects. So the Prophet Sallallahu grows up kind of in the circle of uh, uh, tribal respect, okay? And he's someone that is revered. He's someone that is looked up to in, in the tribes of Mecca. So the Prophet ﷺ obviously inherited this, this, this reverence and this respect. This is all pre-Islamic revelation, pre-message. Abdul Muttalib also as well, he's an elder, he passes away. So the Prophet ﷺ then is left in the care of his uncle, Abu Talib. Abu Talib lives longer than the rest of the family, the immediate family of the Prophet ﷺ and is able to live with him up until the age of his revelation, that he witnesses the entire thing. So he basically raises him, he grows the Prophet Sallallahu and, and the, the narrations about him are so beautiful. Abu Talib loved the Prophet Sallallahu so much that even though he had his own children to take care of, for example, when it came to dinner time, he would always set aside a small portion for the Prophet Sallallahu directly. Like everyone else had to eat from the same plate. But he would put some aside for the Prophet because he just had so much love and sympathy for him as a young man. So incredible, so inspiring at such a young age after going through such loss. And so Abu Talib took very deep care of the Prophet. And this year, the year of grief and sadness. Are you done? You want to go? He wants to. The year of grief and sadness was the year that the Prophet ﷺ lost his uncle as well. But it's interesting because it, it's not just that he lost the, tra the, not just the tragedy of losing his uncle, but there's tragedy on top of tragedy. And that is that he, وسلم, desperately wanted to give his uncle the message of Islam before passing. 
because he saw this as, as a natural step. You've been someone that has taken care of me. You've nurtured me. I mean, to describe him as a foster father is not, is, is not inaccurate. That he, he gave him that father figure that he desperately needed, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to protect him and take care of him. And gave him immunity from all of the Quraysh, even after, because Abu Talib was there when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa received revelation, the Prophet had immunity socially from being attacked because of who? Because of his family. So he was being supported by his wife Khadija, emotionally, mentally, financially, and then his uncle Abu Talib had like his back socially. No one could step on him. No one could come near him because they would have to answer to his uncle and the tribe that they belong to. So when his uncle passes away, it's already a huge loss, but the way in which he passed away was so tragic. The Prophet ﷺ told his uncle after, you know, years, months, and what amounted to years of pleading, his uncle pleading with him that please stop preaching this message. The Prophet ﷺ eventually gets it through to Abu Talib's heart and his mind that this is not, I'm not making this up. You think I'm making this up? You think this is just some like hobby? No. I was given this revelation by God and my job is to, to give this to people, to, to teach people. And he said, even if you gave me everything, like the sun and the moon, which in Arabic is an expression meaning if you gave me everything, like all the impossible riches of the world, I could not stop doing this. And at that point, Abu Talib became, in his heart, he had a point of satisfaction that, okay, you know what? Maybe my nephew is not just like onto something. Maybe he's actually, or maybe he's not just making it up. Maybe he's actually onto something. So subhanAllah, when he passes away, he's sitting at his bedside and he's telling his uncle, are you done, mom? No. He's telling his, she keeps fidgeting, I don't know. He's telling his uncle that, you know, please, just, this is your last moment, that you're breathing your last. Give me one word. Just say the name Allah. Give me one thing that on the day of judgment, I can take with me and I can stand there before God and I can say, God, he believed in you. He was there. And Abu Talib, as he's about to utter something, he's thinking, his, his, his colleagues from Quraysh, his peers, all of the enemies of the Prophet Wasallam, they look at Abu Talib on his deathbed with no mercy. And they say, now? Now is when you're going to turn your back on the way of your forefathers? Now is when you're going to give it all up? You made it this far and on your deathbed you're going to utter this new religion? Now is when you're going to do it. How shameful. Don't be, a, don't be a coward. Have some courage. Die upon what you lived your life on. Don't change last minute. And at that moment, Abu Talib, he looks at the Prophet Wasallam and he says that, I'm going to be on what I've been on. And that's it. And he passed away. And this was a heartbreaking moment for the Prophet Wasallam. Imagine just a few weeks prior, you lost your spouse. And now you lost your uncle, who was your father figure, but you didn't just lose him, you lost him in a way that was so traumatizing. And I want to stop here and point out something. A lot of us, one of the greatest challenges to faith, one of the greatest sources of crises of faith is loss, is when people experience loss. When, when someone goes through a trial or a difficulty, the first question that is asked is, why me? And we're not asking our neighbor. We're not like, hey, why me? We're asking God. People look up at the heavens and they say, what is happening? And it's interesting to know that the, the messenger of God, who we are told by himself is the most beloved of God, has been put through immense challenge, immense loss, born without a father who's living, lost his mother at a young age, lost his grandfather, lost his uncle, lost his wife, will lose children. And somehow, logically, when we experience trial, we instantly think that this means God is angry or God is unfair. How? How, when his most beloved, the messenger of God, the one whose job it is to teach us, maybe there is a wisdom, maybe there is some profound divine knowledge, some lesson in this loss that is meant to be a sympathy for those of us who later will believe in this message and will experience loss ourselves. One thing that I always think about is someone who accepts Islam, someone who converts to Islam, and they worry about their own parents or their loved ones who aren't going to accept Islam, maybe, potentially, we hope that they do. But, and then they pass away. 
the deep pain that they experience. And then I always remember the story of Abu Talib. And I wonder that maybe, just maybe, the Prophet وسلم, peace and bless me upon him, was put through that trial so that later, 1400 years later in Dallas, Texas, someone who accepted his religion and lost a loved one who was outside of Islam can look at their messenger and say, you know what? The pain's not gone, but at least I'm not alone. At least I'm not alone. So this happened. And then the third thing. So there's three events that occurred. And then what this brought about this revelation. The third moment. And this was the Prophet Sallallahu journey to a nearby city called Ta'if. Okay? Mecca was becoming, after losing his wife and losing his uncle, Mecca was becoming uninhabitable for Muslims. We're talking about torture. We're talking about harassment. All kinds of horrific things. And now that the the Muslims were becoming socially weaker. There was no place for them to go without being harassed. And there was no law really that was protecting them. They were becoming refugees. And, and, and it's interesting because they were people that had to go seek refuge somewhere else. But they were also like, they were natives. These are their neighbors. These are their, some of them, this is their family. Look at the story of Mus'ab. Mus'ab bin Umair, his own family is the one that's like, doing this to him, torturing him and putting him through. Why? <laughs> because he believes in the sun. And so the Prophet وسلم, he's at the same time he's experiencing his own loss. And you know, that's the greatest thing about tragedy and loss is that the world keeps spinning. It's one of the greatest things to, to deal with, subhanAllah. A person could go through the most heart-wrenching gut punch in their life and the next day they have to call in to work and say, I can't come in. Isn't that so incredible? The dunya is so interesting. The Prophet Sallallahu wife passes away, his uncle passes away, but he still has a community of people he has to look out for. And so he, in his negotiations with the Meccans, they're not working, they're not giving them anything. And so he has to go to a nearby city known as Ta'if. And Ta'if, by the way, is beautiful. It's not like Denton at all. I had to. Ta'if is beautiful. Ta'if, if you thought Roots had a lot of trees, Ta'if was described as date palm trees. In fact, one of the interesting things was that the Prophet Sallallahu was given a prophecy. He was given a prophecy that his refuge, the city that will be a sanctuary for the Muslims, will be a land of date palm trees. And so obviously now, hindsight's 2020, what does everyone know that that was? Medina. Medina's got date palm trees, right? But Ta'if also had date palm trees. And so initially there was some thought, if you read the books of Sirah, there was some thought that maybe this refuge for the believers now from Mecca is going to be Ta'if. And the Prophet, so he goes to Ta'if and the, what he faced there, the experience he had there, let me just describe it in one hadith. Later in Medina, his wife Aisha is asking him, what was the hardest day of your life, Ya Rasulullah? Was it Uhud? Was it the battle of Uhud? Where you lost your companions, you lost your uh, uncle Hamza, you lost so much, you yourself were injured, the believers had to retreat after losing so much. Was that the hardest day of your life, Ya Rasulullah? Aisha is asking him, she's interviewing him, was that the hardest day you ever experienced? And he says, no. The hardest day, harder than that day of the battle of Uhud, where I lost my family, I lost my friends, and we had to retreat. The Muslims had to run. They had to retreat back to Medina in order to protect themselves and their community. He said, the hardest day was the day of Thaif. The day that I was rejected at Thaif. Why? Why? Think about it. Medina was still a place to go back to. In Thaif, when he was turned away, there was nowhere to go back to. There was nowhere to hide. There was nowhere for the Muslims to go and, and, and protect themselves. And so the Prophet Sallallahu having lost his wife and his uncle, and now he feels like, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he's like failing his own community. And we, of course, know he's not. But he feels the pressure. And he's rejected in the most aggressive way. They launch stones and sharp objects at him after he goes and meets with them beautifully with his character and tries to Work out a deal. He's trying just to gain refuge, right? He's trying to say, just let us occupy a small corner. Let us just build some homes and live here, some tents. 
right? We don't need much. Clay, leaves, we'll just, we'll, we will mind our own business. We just want a place to live safely. And because of the tribal arrogance and the ego, they reject these people. And they reject the Prophet in a way that was so harsh. They said that, that day, the blood that dripped down from his head, وسلم, it stained his sandals that were made of leather. So they took on like a red hue from that day. That's the day of five. So some scholars of Sirah say all of this happened in six weeks. How many of us would just give up? Could you imagine? I mean, some of us get like a paper cut at first thing in the morning. And we're like, I can't work today. I can't imagine the problem. I can't imagine it. I genuinely cannot imagine it. How he kept going, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What an incre- and this is why we say, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Oh Allah, send your peace and blessings upon our messenger Muhammad. Why? Because can you imagine after all of this, going through all this, he still has to do his job and deliver the message so that maybe people 1400 years later in Dallas, Texas could hear about it. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the scholars agree as a response to this moment, sends down this surah. And some of the scholars of tafsir, the people who are the elaborators and the unpack the unpackagers of Quran, those who further you know contextualize Quran, they say that this surah has a couple of unique elements to it. Number one is that this surah, some of them say, was revealed all at once. So the Quran was not revealed all at once; it was revealed in, in, in piecemeal, and then it was, it was arranged with Angel Jibril. Okay. So this surah was revealed all at once. The other thing is that this is the only chapter in the Quran, number 12, chapter of Yusuf, Joseph, in which the story of Yusuf is being given. If you look elsewhere in the Quran, you don't find the story being elaborated on. You, may, you find the mention of his name, the name of his father, but you don't find the story being elaborated on. So there's a couple of unique experiences that this surah gives. A couple other things that are unique, and I'm not trying to be a, a spoiler here, but Yusuf also goes through a lot of the same things that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam goes through. Some, some people, some of the scholars of history, they say that Yusuf, his birth mother had passed. And because of that, he had to live with his father and also his brothers were not actually his blood brothers. Blood brothers. Wow. They were his half-brothers. They were from another Later marriage, or previous marriage, I apologize, because they were older than him. And so he was, the Prophet ﷺ went through something very similar, that he lost his father and then lost his mother. Yusuf, Prophet Yusuf, lost his mother and also had relatives, siblings, right, that were with him. But he never really kind of had his own, like, circle, his nuclear family, that many, many people, the majority of human beings, considered to be like their, their, their bubble of protection. Okay? And so this surah is sent down as a way to give the Prophet Wasallam some consolation. And it's very interesting because Allah could have sent down many different things. Allah could have sent down, Allah could have sent him money. Allah could have sent him an army. Allah could have given him anything. But he gave him a surah in the Quran. He gave him a chapter in the Quran. Why do you think that is? Anyone? Why did Allah send a message of revelation from the Quran instead of sending like materials? Yeah. What's that? It's the greatest what? Greatest level of consolation for him. Very good. Right? This was something that gave Allah described it. Oh, when Allah talked about why did he reveal the Quran, he said, so we can make your heart strong. So we can give your heart some strength. It's very interesting. Sometimes in life, you'll be going through something and materials don't fill the void that you have. You know, you'll be sick. Has anyone here ever gotten so sick that they like lost their ability to taste? COVID trigger, sorry, not that. <laughs> have you gotten like, like, okay, you know what I'm talking about? Like you're so sick that you don't want to eat. You have a fever or the flu or something, okay? So like, imagine that you're, you're, you're really ill and someone comes up to you and they're like, what do you want to eat? I'll buy you whatever you want. I'll, I'll take you wherever you want. At that point, like, 
you, you can't even you can't even think about food, let alone actually try it out. And then there's sometimes people are like, oh, okay, oh, you're feeling down, you're feeling sick, you gone through. Uh, let's go to the mall. I'll buy you whatever you want, right? I'm making up these friends. I don't know who these people are. I need them in my life, right? You need a new new ACL. Let me get that for you, okay? <laughs> right? So they might even buy you gifts, but Subhanallah, it's it's so interesting. And I think that some of you are nodding. I think you know where I'm going with this. Material things don't fill that void. Sometimes what fills that void is the company of somebody or the kind words that they leave with you. Like sometimes it's the phone calls, it's the text messages, or it's the person coming to visit. This is why it's the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ that when someone is ill, when someone is sick, when they're ailing, or when they're experiencing calamity or tragedy, it's Sunnah to go visit. Not long, brief, but to let them know that you're there for them. And so in this moment of tragedy, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down not just some words, but his words. Not just something kind, but the perfect story so that the Prophet ﷺ can derive some consolation from this moment. Okay? So I'm going to load it, inshallah, and then we're going to uh, uh, begin uh, looking through the first couple of verses, inshallah. Let me put it up here. Sorry, Apple TV was updating when we first started. So I didn't want to load it up. Oh, the menu. Uh-oh. All right. Window, first full screen. Okay, Bismillah. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala begins this chapter. Alif Lam Ra. Okay, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Alif Lam Ra. Alif Lam Ra. We went over this with when we did Surah Al-Baqarah and a couple other. We did this with Surah Al-Kahf as well. These are known as the broken letters. This happens in the Quran numerous times. It happens sometimes with one letter, sometimes with two sometimes with three, and sometimes with more. These broken letters are an interesting concept. They don't have a meaning as a word. So you don't read it as a word. There's no translation. In fact, if you look at the translation, what does it say here? Oh, yeah, I got to bump this up a little bit. What does the translation say? Very good. Alif Lam Ra. Excellent. 100%. Okay. So these letters are unanimous. All scholars agree they all agree that the meaning of these letters is definitively unknown. Now, there have been some scholars that have been have tried to, like, okay, let's explore what they could mean, but what they all agreed on at the end of the day is that we don't know what they mean, okay? But what they did say was that although we don't know the exact meaning, we know what the effect could have been. You see, the Arabs at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu they were extremely, the word is fasih, they were extremely literate, rhetorically astounding. I mean, like some of the most elaborate and and best orators you would ever, in their language, you could ever imagine, okay? They had complete control over their language, meaning that the, even like the average kid could recite poetry, right? There are videos floating on the internet where you'll hear like a Bedouin, a man who has, you know, he's basically a nomad and he's herding to sheep in the middle of the, of the Sahara or like the Arabian peninsula in the desert and they these these saudi kids or these people from yemen or whoever they're, they're you know gulf uh teenagers drive by and they're like hey what's going on and the guy starts responding but he responds in poetry could you imagine that it's like having a conversation with dr seuss like <laughs> like you're talking to this person and they're not just responding i mean some of us have like we won't even respond we're like uh blue you know <laughs> This person's responding, and they're responding in poetry, like in a meter and with rhyme and meaning and like double entendres, okay? The language of the Arabs was something that they took a lot of pride in. You know how in America we say freedom? Right? People are like, what's so good about America? You're like, freedom, right? In, in, in the Arabian Peninsula, what's so good about Arabia? They would say our language, right? The way that we can... And, and, there, and this is true with all languages to some degree. You can't completely even translate, right? I'm sure some of you speak other languages where the translation from that language to English is like, ah, it's hard, you know, it's difficult. It's kind of hard to, Urdu, this happens all the time with Urdu. This happens all the time with different languages, okay? So what's the value in sending down as part of the Quran these broken letters that have no meaning? The scholars say very beautifully, 
that the Arabs were so proud of this language, their communication, their medium. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a means of displaying to them their own need for religion and faith and God, he showed them that using your own letters, using your own tools, your own grammar and syntax and everything, that we can construct a message, the Qur'an, that even you cannot outdo. There are other verses in the Qur'an that say, فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِثْلِهِ If you think that this is man-made, if you think that human beings came up with this, go ahead. فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِثْلِهِ Go ahead, come up with a surah, a chapter just like this. In another place in the Qur'an, Allah says, come up with an ayah. Just compose a book just like this. And let's see. And Allah Ta'ala even says, bring your own witnesses. Don't even call like prophets and scholars. Bring your own witnesses. And let them decide. Read it. Blind taste test. Is this Qur'an or is this, is this divine or is this human? And so this Alif Lam Ra, these broken letters as they begin certain chapters of the Qur'an, are reminders of the miraculous nature of this book. That even as much as you control the language itself, O oh Arab people, that's being revealed to, your tongue is fluent in this. You cannot one-up the divine revelation. And that's why whenever you look at these letters, they are always followed by a praise of the book itself. So what does Allah Ta'ala say? Allah says, Alif Lam, ri, alif lam Ra, these are the verses, the ayat of the kitab that is mubin. Let's talk about each word here. I know that we're, I spent a long time on the intro. Are you doing okay? Yeah, okay. All right. What's this? This is Quran? Yeah, good job. Okay, mashallah. Okay, so let's talk about this for a second. Tilka is a word that means that something, it's referring to something, this. But typically, when, it talk, when we're talking spatially, tilka has two reference points. There's close and there's far. Hada and tilka, or hadihi and tilka. Okay? Tilka actually means that something is distant. So what is Allah referring to here in this verse? Tilka ayatu al-kitab al-mubin. That these are the verses of the clear book. But the distance is kind of interesting. Because obviously, if you're reading a divine message, you don't want to be distant from it. You want to be close. In order for you to take le lessons from this, you want to be someone that's, your proximity is not far away. But see, the Arabs were not so literal in their language, right? They had, they had, they had a layer of depth and meaning almost in every word. So the word tilka, if you look at it in the, in the Arabic dictionary, it doesn't just refer to spatial distance. It refers to status. Status. You know, if someone, if you're standing right next to somebody and you really respect that person, and they say, yeah, you two, you guys both play basketball? Or you guys both do this? Or you both do that? But that person is like way better than you? How do you describe? You say, no, they're way ahead of me. You describe them in a spatial way, even though geographically you're like right next to each other. Right? So, for example, if Muaz is standing next to me and they say, hey, you guys play soccer? I say, well, Muaz, mashallah, play soccer. What I do, I don't know if you can call that soccer. Right? I don't know if legally you can call that soccer. Right? I'm, I'm saying Mu'az is way far ahead of me when it comes to soccer. That's what tilka does in the Arabic language. It's not just saying spatially that this thing is way far away. It's saying that as a status, as a reverence, as a quality, this book is a book that is unlike anything else that you read. It's not like any other book. And because of that, you got to come to the book differently. Have you guys ever studied organic chemistry? We have a lot of Muslims in this audience. Right? You're like pre-med, pre-dental, pre-farm, pre-everything. Okay? Tell me how you study organic chemistry, guys. Repetition. How many of you studied your textbooks? How many of you do work, quote-unquote, work from home, right? WFH. Looks like it's coming to a close. May Allah Ta'ala protect us. <laughs> I'm not trying to scare anybody or trigger anybody here. May Allah protect us. Seriously, may Allah, if anyone's got laid off, may Allah Ta'ala make it easy to find something better, inshallah. But it looks like this era is coming, you know. Why? Because where did y'all work from home? They should have called it WFB, right? Work from bed, right? That's because that, that's what most people did, right? Because why? Because when something is mundane, okay, when something is, is just normal, 
It's not special. How do you treat it? You treat it like anything else. So if you opened up a brand new vacuum cleaner and you wanted to look at the manual to see how to put it together, you're not going to like sit, light the candle, you know, dim the lights and open up the manual and look and say, oh, let me really focus in. You're not going to start taking notes on this. No, you're going to flip through it. If you're a male, you're not even going to look at the manual, right? You're just going to figure it out, YouTube a video, and then, you know, call a friend who's smart, who's an engineer, who can build it for you, right? The point being is that when something is not valuable, we don't give it value. When we don't see something as valuable, we don't give it value. And that's part of the challenge with this Quran is that because it's in book format, because it's a message, we assume that it's just like anything else. Well, I read, I read my fiction book in bed, laying down, half asleep. Why can't I read the Quran like that? I read this book in this position. I read this on one, I listen to this on 2X, right? This podcast or this audiobook. Why can't I? Because the, the function and the goal of this book is completely different than every other book. And because the function is different, the goal is different, the approach has to be different. What's the point of this book? Allah describes it. Ayatu al kitab al mubin. These are the verses. Interesting, this word verse, ayah, anyone here named ayah? Anybody? No? Not even one? All right. Okay, look at all the Palestinians. Nobody? All right. <laughs> ayah is a really cool word because it has two meanings. Ayah in Arabic means a verse, like the verse of Quran, ayah. But it also means a sign. When Allah refers to the signs, you guys see the sunset on the way here today? Right? That, this, is, this is an ayah from God. Allah describes the creation of the heavens and the earth as ayat. He says these are ayat. Okay? So what's so interesting about that? Well, in the Quran, when Allah uses one word for two different meanings, it means they have a relationship. Okay? When he uses one word for two different meanings, it means they have a relationship. Okay? So what does that mean? It means that the verses in the book and the signs all around us are connected. And the heart of a believer, the person who believes in God, does not exist a single day of their life. Sorry. Does not exist a single day of their life except that what? Except that what they see in the earth around them reminds them of God. And what they read in the book in front of them reminds them of his creation. But if I'm cutting one part of that equation out of my life, if I'm not reading the verses in the book, then I'm seeing the same things that everyone else is seeing. I'm witnessing the sunsets, which is about the only good thing we have in Dallas, Texas. Right? Like, what nature do you have there? I'm like... Clouds, orange clouds every day at Mokhrib, right? You're witnessing the same thing that everyone is witnessing. I guarantee it. Go on Instagram and type in hashtag Dallas sunset. And you're going to get the same. Are you doing that right now? You... You're going to get, you're going to see everyone took the same pictures today. I apologize. You're not special. <laughs> but you know what's crazy? The special people are the ones who recognize that the artist behind that sunset is the one that created them. They realize that. They see that sunset and they don't think that it's just science. They don't. They realize that the one who created the laws of science, the one who created physics, the one who created chemistry, the one who created biology, yes, even organic chemistry, Allah created that. The one who created all of these sciences is the one who illustrated that incredible display. And that's why when that person sees that, they say, Allah. Their heart has no response besides subhanAllah. How perfect is God? How perfect is Allah? That's why the verse in the Quran says what? Rabbana ma khalaqta hadha ba'tila. Oh Allah, you didn't create this for no reason. There's no way. There's no way. You guys ever watch Planet Earth? You guys ever tell you the story about when I met Sheikh Sharif Hatim al -Auni? Famous scholar in Mecca from the family of the Prophet Sallallahu I got to sit with him. And I sat with him with other scholars. And so what I did was I shut my mouth. I sat with him with six scholars. And he's like, what's your name? And I went, hmm? I don't have a name. I'm just here. And I remember everyone asked their questions. And at the end of the gathering, he looked at me and he said, do you have any questions? Anything you want to talk about? Very nice. Extremely nice. And I said, no, Sheikh, no, I have no questions. And then Sheikh Abdel Nasser was next to me. He goes, ask him. Like, these are the moments you're going to regret if you don't take advantage of them. This was in 2019 at Umrah. 
it was right before COVID hit and right. So, and he's like, you're never going to get this access again. You never know. So I said, Sheikh, I, I, I want to, well, part of my life's work is that I want to be able to communicate and give a compelling argument for people to understand the existence of God. And I said, what texts, what books can I use as resources as I translate from Arabic into English and I try to develop some reading material and some content for people to understand God's existence? And he said, uh, planet Earth? <laughs> Wallahi. <laughs> Which means, do you know planet Earth? Hell right, planet Earth? On the BBC? <laughs> And I'm sitting there, and all these scholars are like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> and he goes, uh, he goes, uh, hello, right, the hummingbird? And he was astounded by the hummingbird. He was like, wallahi, right, on the television, ams, al-barnamaj hadha. Like, I saw this program yesterday, and I just said, Allah. And he just said every single thing that I saw on planet Earth, from the deep sea, right? I mean, some of that stuff is downright creepy <laughs> from the existence of like birds and the mountains. And he said, we don't need to write complicated books on God's existence because God's existence is written around us. And it's only the heart that is blind that can't recognize that. Right? That's what Allah Ta'ala said. Allah Ta'ala, he, he said about this when he talked about the verses and the signs. He said that for those people, that their heart is pure, they see nothing but God's existence all around them. But for those people, that their heart is sick, when they see the same things that we see, that everyone else sees, they're like, what is the purpose of this? Where did this come from? And this was an answer from like a world-renowned scholar. Allah Ta'ala says, Tilka ayat. These are the signs. We read this book and we connect it with our life. We, you know what? And it's not just the beautiful signs. Sometimes it's the really, really ugly ones, man. Sometimes you go through a moment of, of, of despair. You go through a moment of darkness, of trial, and you have to connect back. You know what Allah Ta'ala called the Quran? He said that it's shifa. It's a cure. He called it a nur. It's a light. He called it huda, it's guidance. What do you need in life when you're going through difficulty? More than a cure, more than guidance, more than a light. You need to see. When you're going through tough times, it just feels like the light was shut out. You can't see anything. Chaos. And Allah Ta'ala said, in this book, there is illumination. You feel lost. And Allah said, in this book, there's hidayah, there's guidance. Sometimes you feel so distant from God, you feel sick. And Allah said, in this book is shifa. There's cure. The more we leave this book on the upper shelves of our homes and we're not accessing it, we're not reading it, we're not regimenting it. You know, subhanAllah, what my doctor said when I got surgery, he said, here is some pain medication. All right. It was a really funny story. When I went to go pick it up from the pharmacist, because we live in, um, I guess, you know, it's not the it's not the opioid belt, but you know it's it's the south, and I guess there's opioid issues and addiction issues. May Allah Ta'ala give you fat to those who struggle. So he's he's sitting there, right? Do you guys know what ACL surgery requires? They have to drill through your bones and they have to use screws to attach your new ACL to your leg. So it's pretty painful. So the pharmacist is sitting there and he goes, All right, here's your medication. Um, please don't take this unless you need to. And I look at him and I said, in my head, I didn't say this to him because I didn't want him to hate me. I said, you've never had your leg drilled through before, clearly. <laughs> right? Because you're in so much pain. The orthopedic surgeon, the one who did the surgery, is like, take it, get ahead of it, because once it starts, you can't catch up the pain. Right? And that's, that's how it is with a lot of cures. If you wait until you start to see symptoms of the illness... It's going to be really, really difficult to catch up. It's not impossible, but it's difficult. And if you don't take the course the way it's supposed to be taken every day, dosage every day, at sometimes twice a day, then not only does the, does the bacterial infection not 
get cured, it becomes what? Come on, nerds. What happens to the bacterial infection if you don't take the antibiotics regularly? It becomes what? Resistant. Very good. The bacteria becomes stronger. It becomes resistant to the cure. Do you know what that means, subhanAllah? If the cure is not taken regularly, if it's ignored, then the sicknesses in the heart will not feel the effects of the cure. So now we got to ask ourselves, how often do we access the cure of the Qur'an? Tilka ayat al-kitab al we're going to wrap up here, inshallah. Can you believe we only did three words? <laughs> Can you believe that? Yeah, she's like, yeah, I hear you talk all day. We ask Allah Ta'ala to give us understanding of this book. We ask Allah Ta'ala to cure our hearts. We ask Allah Ta'ala to make us people that the Qur'an inspires us, that the Qur'an guides us, that the Qur'an illuminates for us. We ask Allah Ta'ala that the Qur'an gives us a cure for our ailments. Just like this surah was sent to the Prophet Wasallam to give him a cure for his sadness. Oh Allah, make the Qur'an the cure for our sadness. Oh Allah, make the Qur'an the, 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 the substance of our life. Make it fill the void that we, that we experience day in and day out. Oh Allah, give us an understanding of you through this book. Allow us to witness your magnificence and your beauty in everything in creation that we see and allow us to become better people. Allow us to become greater in character, greater in morals, greater in discipline, as a result of us coming closer to you, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaq burka wa natubu ilayk. Jazakumullah khairan everybody. Isha is going to be about five minutes, inshallah. So I would encourage everybody to head on over, please. Also, if you sat on one of the chairs, please, please, please fold it up for us. Take it to the back and stack it very nicely. If I could have some of the people who know how to stack, head back there and help, inshallah. I'd really appreciate that. Jazakumullah khairan. Good job, you sat up here the whole time? Are you Baba's special helper? You want to go to Mama now? You want to stay with me? You want to stay with me? Are you sure? I appreciate you. Who's that? Who's that? That's new. Uh, it is something for <laughs> Yeah, it was. You want to stay where in this room? Okay, I will take you home with me. Mike, salam. How are you doing? Good like to see you. Well, Andreas, how are you? Good to meet you. Good to meet you. Thanks for coming, man. I appreciate your I appreciate your company and your presence here. You're always welcome here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate you, man. I appreciate it, man. It is absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, buddy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A true story, man. I was blown away. I was blown away. It's incredible. It's incredible. Of course, of course. It's undeniable. It's undeniable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Appreciate you, Andre. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Slowly but surely. Appreciate you, man. Salaikum. How you doing? Alhamdulillah. Good to see you. Are you all right? Salaikum. How you doing? High five. High five? Yes. Yay. Yeah, mashallah. Um, I'm going to be out of town this weekend. Okay. I think we have our Bible study like this weekend slash Monday. Yes. And my husband's going to be like outpatient, like the procedure show. Oh, okay. Is he okay? Yeah. Is it the same like, thing, the pain? Okay. okay. Yeah, we're just going to be talking to um, Nura. Nura, yeah. yeah. 